right, let's go ahead and get started this evening. Glad to have you here and online as well, and so thank you for being faithful uh, to the services, and we'll enjoy uh, just getting together in God's Word and enjoying some singing and pray that it'll be a refreshing time for you for this week to attack your work week and, and finish out strong and look forward to uh, getting together with God's people on Sunday again. And so pray that this will be a good uh, encouragement and, and strengthening for you. We're going to uh, begin this evening with showers of blessings, 335. Let's stand together. We'll sing verse 1 and 4. Showers of blessing. I think actually we're going to get some showers today, or tomorrow anyway, it's on its way. There shall be showers of blessing, this is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing, sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessing, oh, that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing, now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessings we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. Amen. 433, since I have been redeemed, we'll sing the first and the last. I have a song I love to sing since I have been redeemed of my Redeemer, Savior, King, since I have been redeemed, since I Savior's name. I have a home prepared for me since I have been redeemed. Where I shall dwell eternally since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. Since I have been redeemed. I will glory in His name since I have been redeemed, I will glory in my Savior's name. Amen. You may be seated. I just want to go over a couple of our announcements. I do want to remind you to be um, getting and thinking through your personal testimony and have that written down. Uh, it should be no longer than two to three minutes and uh, practice giving that. I would like to start uh, uh, having people share those. And uh, I think it's, it's really a great time of fellowship when we talk about how we were born into the family of God. You share your experience, and I share mine. And um, Brother Shea, I talked to a gentleman today that uh, you shared your testimony with him, and he was telling me about that. He said, I thought it was the greatest thing that you two were talking about uh, your testimonies. Mario, uh, that uh, did your roof. Yeah, and uh, he said, I talked with that Chinese man, and what was his name? And I, he said, yeah, yeah, that's it. And, and so, but that left a big impression on him that two believers were able to share uh, their salvation story. And, and uh, he, he, he was really uh, impressed by that, and that meant a lot to him. So your, your testimony is really important. People love to hear that, and, and, and a lost person needs to hear uh, how you responded to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so I just want to encourage you, write it down, two to three minutes, and uh, we'll be getting, uh, we'll, we'll be uh, sharing those. Uh, Lord willing, if you're not going to pass out from fear uh, of getting your testimony in front of a crowd, but if you can't do it amongst friends here, uh, you know, uh, it would be very difficult for you to do that with lost people. So I think it will be a good, uh, a good practice for you. And so please be mindful of prepping for that. Also, 
I'm hoping that this is going to be uh, communicated well on my part. Um, we have the new missionary prayer sheets um, with, our, with our new missionaries and then the missionaries that are no longer on the field that came off of our list. And so they're on the back counter there. And what you need to do is finish your current list this week. So finish your current list this week. And one more time for good measure, finish your current list this week. Pick up a new list, pick up a new list, pick up a new list after finishing your current missionary this week, and then go to the next one on the new sheet. So if you are on 17 on the old sheet, where will you be on the new sheet? 18, very good. All right, class, I'm communicating. Oh, I, I need to get a star for this. And so pick up your new sheet, go to the next one on the list, and that way our, our new missionaries won't be nine weeks before we start praying for them. We'll be able to get them right in the, the rotation. Everybody that understands that, raise your hand. Beautiful. How about on Facebook? Outstanding, wonderful. Yes, I see that hand. All right, good. And so you can get those. Um, and if you need one and you can't make it in, um, please shoot us a text. And uh, I can have Miss Tracy send you one if you absolutely cannot be here, um, and we'll do that. All right. Uh, also, um, let me just check real quick to make sure that I've got all uh, our announcements here. Uh, oh, can you believe it? Daylight savings time. Got to set your clocks ahead, March the 14th. And, uh, you know, they just ought to do away with that silly daylight saving time. Huh? Are they trying to? Well, we, they need to try a little harder. I'm tired of having to remember that stuff. And uh, anyway, you may love it. I, I don't have a good appreciation for it. Um, and then uh, on March the 28th, we'll be doing uh, Lord's Supper uh, on the evening service. And so be planning for that um, on March the 28th. All right. Uh, and do we have any sign-up sheets in the back that need to be signed up? What? Okay, so uh, we still need some folks to sign up for our nursery. We're wanting to re-engage that and get that going from COVID. Uh, we kind of backed off a, a little bit on that. People weren't comfortable being in there and, uh, and, and actually leaving their babies in there. They wanted them with them. And uh, what we're just kind of concerned as it's starting to open back up and we're getting visitors now, we, we don't want to uh, miss out on an opportunity to be a blessing to the parents and allow the parents to be able to sit in a service. So if you'd be willing to um, uh, work in the nursery and if we get enough people, uh, Tracy was saying uh, we can rotate in a fashion so where you don't have to do it every week. Um, many hands make light work and so uh, please sign up for that if, uh, if you can. That would be a blessing uh, to the church. All right, let's go ahead and uh, get started this evening. Of course, giving is as usual. We have the offering boxes on back. You can give online. And uh, thank you for your faithfulness, for your faith promise as well. And let's remember to be faithful for our missionaries. Um, all right, we're talking about friends, faith, and fellowship um, this evening. How many of you noticed that I pulled the pulpit back from the front? You know why I did that? Because I always want, I, I, I never like to stay behind the pulpit. I would, remember when I used to go down in the aisle way and, and I really enjoy get, So this way I can go right up to the front and I can feel like I'm out in the crowd and, uh, and just make, you know, make a big circle here and, and get back to it. And I don't have to go down the stairs and worry about going off camera. So uh, we got that going for us. It's a beautiful thing. And everybody said amen. All right. So now, uh, friendship, faith, and fellowship. We're... We're just coming, uh, starting our focus night. We're coming through some teaching on this. We're gearing back up uh, from last year where, where we just got hit with this uh, COVID business and everything shut down. Um, and, and we got out of the, the momentum of our discipleship conference. And uh, I wanted to just really get back to it and connect because this is what I want the focus of the church to be as individuals, what we are doing to serve the Lord as individuals, 
We need to engage. I'm telling you, if, if, if I'm lying, I'm dying. Uh, we are, uh, this world is coming off of its hinges. And the Lord's coming for his church is close. This world is not our friend. Lost people are becoming very antagonistic to the gospel, to churches, and we need to go out until the trumpet sounds and try to reach them with the gospel. And we need to be vigilant about it. It's not enough just to invite people to church. I think what's going to reach the few that will be saved at this midnight hour is going to be by engaging in their life and trying to build personal relationship with them so that they'll listen to what you have to say. So we're doing this friendship, faith, and fellowship, and we've been preaching through this for quite some time now. And uh, last year, we, we talked about 10 guidelines um, that we want to incorporate and keep in mind as we're getting outside of our comfort zone and, and trying to engage in a relationship with somebody that we don't know. And how many of you are uncomfortable with that? Raise your hand. Okay, a few. Me, I, I, your pastor is raising both of his hands and both of his feet. Um, that's not a comfortable thing for me, but it's a necessary thing. It's a mandate from God that we share the gospel with a lost world. And so we need to be doing that. And it's much easier to do it in a group setting uh, as opposed to individually reaching out, making a connection in somebody's life and trying to befriend them for Christ. And so we talked about some things to keep in mind as we used Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch as kind of that poster uh, uh, scripture uh, to, to go join ourselves to a chariot, somebody's chariot, somebody's life, as Philip went and joined himself to the Ethiopian's uh, chariot and gave the gospel to him, expounded the gospel to him, and that man got saved and, and went back to his own country, his own people, and, uh, and spread the gospel there. And, and Philip went on to the next one. And so there's, there's an engaging that you and I need to do in the lives of uh, lost people to, to earn the right to share our faith. And we looked at Paul on Mars Hill and uh, how he engaged and preached the gospel to a very ungodly group of people that had pretty much a God for everything they needed. And, uh, and so he gave them the truth and, uh, and so it was an obedient way of life that Paul had uh, to give the gospel. And he literally spent his entire life communicating the word of God, communicating the gospel. And so we looked at guideline number one. Uh, part of the trouble that we'll have is that blind people, they can't see. And uh, they can't see because they're lost. Uh, the Word of God has to be uh, given. The Holy Spirit of God has to give understanding and has to draw. And, uh, and you and I are part of that process to preach the Word to them. Uh, and so they also have an enemy. We looked at Satan blinds the minds of lost people. And uh, they need Jesus in order to see. Then we looked at guideline number two. Position yourself as a teacher. We need to be the ones that are prepared to explain, teach, preach, share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be seasoned in that. We need to understand the Bible verses of salvation. The Romans Road or John chapter uh, uh, 14, verse number 6. You know, uh, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Or, or, or be able to go through the Romans Road or, or John 3, 16. We need to be familiar with that so that we can teach and instruct uh, uh, those that are in need of the gospel. And so we talked about that. We talked about guideline, um, uh, those were the only two that we got to. So tonight we're going to talk about guideline three and how we are engaging in people's lives. And this is uh, really going to key off of what we were talking about last week. Remember last week we were talking about having some discernment, um, not just blanketly uh, giving the gospel out or, or, or engaging in a way that's not profitable. In fact, the Word of God cautions us not to cast our pearl before swine. And I don't want to use that as a cop-out to, uh, to make sure and wait till we have some lost person that's 
crawling across the desert, ready to expire, and saying, please give me the gospel, and now we'll give it to them. That's not what Jesus is saying, casting pearl before swine. Casting pearl before swine is giving the gospel to somebody that's opposed to it, that doesn't want it, that's adamant about it. And so uh, we, we, this is going to lead to guideline number three, avoiding foolish questions, and it's going to take some discernment there. And uh, the Bible actually has a statement in it in, um, excuse me, in Proverbs that I, I find pretty interesting, Proverbs 26, verse 4 and 5, and it seems like it's a contradiction, but two separate things are being addressed here. And the Bible says, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. So let's pause there and address verse number four. So as you're engaging in people's lives, you may come across somebody that is just wanting to sidetrack you with silly questions. They're wanting to get into a bit with you. They're not interested in being born again. And so it's saying a fool. Answer not a fool. Well, how does the Bible describe a fool? Do what? He doesn't believe in God. The fool has said in his heart there is no God. And so that's what uh, Solomon's addressing here in Proverbs. Answer not a fool, somebody that's rejecting God according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. So don't get swept up or caught up in that foolish jesting or, or conversation that's not profitable. If they're not seeking, don't engage on their level. Otherwise, you'll end up being just a big of a fool. And so arguments start. Uh, testimony gets drugged through the mud because you lose patience and maybe you get frustrated. How many of you have ever gotten frustrated talking to somebody? How many of you have ever responded uh, and then later you went home or, or driving down the road and you think, man, I shouldn't have said that? Well, what we did was we answered a fool according to their folly. Sometimes we've answered believers according to their folly. It's not exclusive to the lost people, you know. So, so that's verse number four. Don't get caught up in somebody that just wants to frustrate and debate you, and it's, it's, it's superficial. They're not earnestly seeking. That's where discernment's going to come in. Can't you tell when somebody's being earnest with you? For the most part, you can. You, they may be able to deceive you uh, a, a little bit, but you can tell when somebody's earnest. But ba ba back up one more, Bob. We didn't finish verse number five. Uh, now, verse number five says, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Now, can you tell me the difference between four and five? He doesn't know, but he needs to, and we're not going to be argumentative. This is stating Scripture and letting God refute. See, there's a difference there. No, that's not correct. The Bible says this, and we won't debate that. Now, I'm reproving them with the Word of God and allowing the Spirit to do that, and I'm not getting caught up in verse 4. Does that make sense? So don't get in the conversational antics of a, a fool or a not, uh, um, I don't know why I'm not phrasing this right, uh, uh, an insincere person. They don't really want to know the truth. They're wanting to debate and argue. Five, answer them according to scripture so that they are reproved and rebuked of the Lord. Everybody follow that? So the next slide, Bob, that's going to be where discernment is going to be a big part of what you and I need to pay attention to. Discernment to know which one is needed and when that's needed. So uh, determine genuine or just being antagonistic. And I don't think I need to belay this point you'll understand and get a feeling when you're talking to somebody. If they're on the same page as you, you'll know that. And here's the beautiful thing. We do not have to be the driver of the bus. All we got to do is be willing to engage. If that takes a day, if it takes a week, if it takes a month, if it takes a year, you let the Spirit of God do their job. We cannot argue somebody into heaven. 
We cannot argue somebody into a relation. Let God do that. Let God convict them. And so use the, use, you know, be determined to uh, have some discernment there and don't, don't get caught up in being antagonistic with them. All right, guideline number four, earn the right to share your faith. Now, that sounds uh, like a, 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 a fluffy statement, but really, uh, I, I've already talked to some, and they say, man, you know, preacher, I'm not comfortable with this. I, I just, you know, I kind of keep to myself. I, I don't want to do that. I get that. I understand that. But earning the right to share your faith is going to cost you something. And so being a servant of the Lord is going to cost you something. Whoever said that Christianity is going to be a no-cost, free, frills, you know, you, you just keep getting, 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 and you don't, you don't do any work. We certainly didn't have to work to get our salvation, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But let me tell you something. We certainly are to work afterwards. And so that's an important aspect of understanding the right to share your faith is going to take time, it's going to take care, it's going to take effort, it's going to take you and I doing the work of the Lord. I, I, I quote it almost every message, wherefore my beloved brethren be ye steadfast, unmovable, always what? About, see you've got it memorized, you didn't really, really, you didn't really try to put that to memory, you just I say it so much, it's, it's caught up abounding in the work of the Lord. And so that, that's going to be guideline number four. Earn the right. You go to work, you earn a wage, right? How many of you, that's easy? You just go in, right, drink a cup of coffee, sit in a chair, and at the end of the week, they hand you a check. That's how it goes, isn't it? Well, hey, that's where it's going. I mean, they're passing out cash like it's candy. But, but that's, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about earning the right. Well, earning the right means you're going to have to roll your sleeves up, go to work. I don't like that. Who cares? God said work. What if I told you guys, well, I, really, I want to be your pastor, but I really don't like this Sunday morning gig. It don't work for me. Let's just forget the, you know, preaching. Why don't we just get together and, you know, eat donuts, bonbons, fudgy bonbons, whatever. I mean, you, would, you wouldn't put up with that. So we need to earn the right. That means we're going to have to work at trying to get to know somebody. And it's going to cost us something. Time, care, and effort. How do you know when you've done that? How do you know when you've, when you've earned the right to share your faith? Uh, well, it's going to be obvious because you're going to position yourself as a servant and you're going to open up an opportunity because you are giving and working and people are going to respond to that. Somebody that is engaging and, and, and being a blessing to somebody, that's a very hard thing to not respond to and like. You do something nice for somebody, uh, they're they're most of the time, unless they're just pretty low character, they're going to respond to that. And, and, and so I want you to position yourself as a servant. I, I got it up here. People don't know how much you care until they know. Uh, how, uh, people don't know, uh, don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so in positioning yourself as a servant to a coworker, a neighbor, a friend, a cashier, uh, whatever the person you're going after, they need to know that you care. And they're going to know that when you are a servant, all right? Now, my scripture is John 13, 12. Could you imagine God Almighty bending down and washing your feet? And he said, if I would do that, you should do that. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? I imagine, well, we know what Peter said, don't we? Peter was the loudmouth. He was the one that spoke before he thought, right? He said, You're not washing my feet, Lord. And Jesus said, 
if you don't get into this illustration here, if, if I don't wash you, you're going to have no part of me. And, and Peter said, well, then, man, give me the shower, Lord. You know, just don't, just don't stop at the feet. Give me the whole thing. He said, you're already clean. But what I'm communicating to you is there's some defilement that you'll pick up along the way. That's got to be cleaned up and made right. And as I were, was willing to do an unpleasant thing to help you in your life, you ought to be willing to do that to others as well. In essence, position yourself as a servant in somebody's life to make a difference, to make their life better or easier, or to make them open up to the gospel. And so position as a servant opens up an opportunity, and then we wait for the door of utterance. So as I'm serving, as Jesus Christ was serving, was there a door of utterance in that passage we just read? Certainly there was, because as Jesus began to do that, Peter asked a question, and the Lord responded. As you begin to engage in the life of somebody, uh, uh, you know, Dennis was, was, was asking in our meeting when we were uh, last Sunday, uh, he was telling me about his neighbors, and his neighbors have... Um, uh, uh, They've helped him, and Dennis has helped them. And so that's a pretty good situation. They have served one another. Uh, your neighbor did your leaves. Is that what you were telling me, Dennis? And so that neighbor actually became a servant to Dennis. And Dennis, in return, right, because that's what people do. You do something nice for me, and what do I want to do back to you? I want to do something. So Dennis, during the winter, had a snowblower, and he blew the snow off their sidewalks. And so Dennis in kind returned that. Well, you do that enough and there's going to come up a door of utterance that God gives because our goal is not just to become a slave to somebody. A servant is a benefit to the one they are serving. They, they want to do that. Your waiter, when you go out to dinner, they, they want to do a good job for you. Well, they should want to do a good job for you, right? Because what do they get in return? Big tip, right? And so as we're serving, our goal is not to just become a slave. Our goal is we are serving because we want to give not just our time and our talent. What our ultimate goal is, the, is to give the gospel. So we wait for a door of utterance. And that door of utterance is going to come in a form of a question. Why are you doing this? Why are you so joyful? Why are you so happy? Now, that's not going to work, Dennis, if you're firing up your snowblower and stupid snow, why don't they get out here and do it? I'm so sorry. Right? And we're grumpy and we're cranky about this servitude, right? No, if we've got the joy of the Lord and we're serving with the right spirit, Holy Spirit, capital H, not our small s spirit. If we're doing that, there's going to come a door of utterance, and that's going to come by way of a question. And when that happens, we're going to transition from this servant relationship into the teaching relationship. Now, you remember we were talking about that earlier tonight, right? Position yourself as a teacher. When they ask the question and they're opening up to you, that's when the teacher part kicks in and we're going to transition from the natural to the spiritual. Does that make sense? Okay, so transitioning from the natural to the spiritual is going to look something like this. And again, Jesus being our example, John chapter 4 and verses 6 through 10. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. A Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Now, th that seems like just part of the story, right? But, but if we dissect that, the Samaritans uh, were despised by the Jews. And, and, and the Jews didn't want to have anything to do with the Samaritans. The Samaritans... As a, as a retaliation, didn't want to have anything to do with the Jews. And, and so there was dissension between these two people. 
so much so that a good Jew actually would walk around Samaria and not go through it just because they didn't want to contaminate their testimony in mingling with the lower people, the mixed breed, if you will. That's really the context there. Jesus goes directly into the town and he asks a question of this lady. He engages, right? And so he does that. He says, uh, can I have a drink of water? And uh, uh, let's continue on. Jesus saith unto her, give me a drink. Verse 8, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Uh, then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest, now, we're talking about water right now, aren't we? He's weary, so he's actually thirsty, isn't he? He, he, he was 100% man, 100% God, so you've been in the thirsty position, right? And so he just asked her for a drink of water, and he uses this opportunity to go from a physical drink of water to a spiritual need that this woman had in her life. And he said, uh, uh, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Now, my next slide kind of goes right along with this. It says, if you can't connect to somebody on a life level, how will you connect on an afterlife level? If you can't connect with them just physically as tangible human beings, how are they going to receive anything of spiritual weight and value uh, if, if, if you can't even be a friend? If you can't even show the love of Christ why would they listen to anything spiritually that you had to say? So the one is going to be contingent upon the other. How many people were reached from somebody standing on a corner and preaching and shouting? There were some, sure, but not many. But how many of us were reached because we knew somebody? And there was a relationship, whether that was family or whether that was friend or whether that was co-worker. Brother Shea had somebody here Sunday, co-worker. You didn't meet him on the street and give him a, right, give him a track, say, hey, come to church with me. They don't know you. Now, that may work, but much better if we know them and are able to invite them. And so uh, we're going to have to connect to them on a physical level and then once we have earned the right, they ask the question, we transition from the natural to the spiritual. They're open to understand more about us. And let me tell you something about us. We have God Almighty that indwells us. It's called the Holy Spirit. His job is to get a bride for the Son. He's got a physical interest in you sharing the gospel with somebody. Because that's his job, and he indwells us, it now becomes our job. And so we see the Lord Jesus Christ transitioning here in quite a spectacular way. And if we're not comfortable with our testimony, and if we're not comfortable with the gospel, we won't know how to transition from the physical to the spiritual. You say, well, this sounds like work, preacher. Yeah, it is. It absolutely is. So, very important. Guideline number four. Guideline number five. Uh, remember, we are, diff we, we are dealing with spiritual warfare. Now, I, I, said, uh, uh, I said this last week, and, and I don't know that I'm going to spend... Uh, a, a lot here, but I'm going to read some passages of Scripture because we did talk about this a little bit last week. This is very important that you understand that Satan's not going to leave you alone to just uh, propagate the gospel and to pluck his children out from underneath his covering. We, 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 are, we are robbing Satan, which is the father 
of the world, lost people. Ye are of your father the devil, Jesus said to, <laughs> amazingly, to the Jews. Right? So, uh, 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 our job is, 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 is going to be resisted by Satan. And it's not going to be people that are, are going to be behind the attacks. Now, Satan will use people, but you and I need to see past uh, a person's disposition, past their actions, past their attacks, past whatever they're going to throw at us because there's somebody pulling that puppet string. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 through 19. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, none of which has anything to do with our government, our mayors, our president, our Congress people. It doesn't have anything to do with that. God is speaking of Satan and his demons that are opposing and fighting against God, the angels, Christ, you and I. There is a war going on. He says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Word of God. Having on the breastplate of righteousness your conduct, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, ready to deliver uh, the good word. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You know, when we don't have much faith, it doesn't take a lot to deter us from our work. Have you ever done a job or done some work where you thought this is useless? It's making no difference. Faith is the substance of things seen. Is that what scripture says? No, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. And so we need to have this shield of faith in order to Deal with this spiritual warfare. Wherefore ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation. Lost person can fight a spiritual warfare. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. You know, I, I thought about this. Uh, the, the word of God speaks so much about prayer, but how often do we pray for the people that we're trying to see saved? God's telling you praying when? Sometime? Always with all prayer and all supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. Sounds a little bit like God saying don't quit. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul ties every teaching and every book that he wrote, he ties it to the giving of the gospel. That is his mandate, that is his job, that is his passion, and he is communicating it to the churches. Even in 2021, we need to be about our Father's business, but we have to be properly girded. You, you, you want to know why there's not so many people getting saved? Because God's people aren't, aren't dressed properly. We're not prepared properly. We're not prayed up. Prayer is a battlefield. Always be praying. Prepare beforehand. Do it. Acts 13, verse 1 through 4. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon uh, that was called Niger and Lucius and Cyrene uh, uh, of Cyrene and Manian uh, which uh, had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. <clears throat> As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. 
you know, they actually expected to be used of God. Why? Because they prayed, they fasted, they prepared themselves, and they went out anticipating God drawing the net. And that's how it works. You and I got to be in that same mindset. This is not our power. We don't have to push this thing. These guidelines are for you and I to rest it in God's hands and for us just to work. You and I are laborers, right? How many of you understand what that term means? I'm not talking about the work aspect, right? How many of you have ever been a general laborer before? And so what did that make you, Romy? I just do what I'm told. I mean, I don't think about it, right? Right, a laborer just stands there. Guy says, do that. Yes, sir, Whew, you go do it. You're directed, you do it. Right, they don't put you in charge of the job, right? Because then you're no longer the laborer, you're the foreman or you're a journeyman or, or you know what I'm saying, right? You, you're starting to get the picture up. A laborer just does what the father tells us. He wrote it down and do this now. Uh, okay. That's what you and I are doing. We're incorporating these guidelines. Why? Because we have scriptural principles that tell us these are the necessary mandates that you and I need to be laborers together. God's the one directing. God's the one telling us. And why? Because he sees the beginning from the end. He already sees the whole project done. A laborer never sees the project done. He only sees the job at hand. But the boss man knows it all, right? Construction site, uh, uh, machine shop, whatever that is, they've got the big picture. And God is our Christ, is our what? Our head, right? And he's the one that's got this mapped out. And that's what we need to realize. They expected God to use them in a great way. I don't have enough time to go on to my next point, so we'll leave that here for today. These are just some things to keep us on track so that we don't think too highly of ourselves, we don't get discouraged, we need to keep ourselves in the book, we need to keep ourselves submitted to the Holy Spirit of God, we need to keep ourselves knowledgeable about what God wants us to do, and as he unfolds that for you and I, we simply respond as a laborer in obedience, giving the gospel, and then we allow the effects of that to be handled by the Holy Spirit of God. Don't be intimidated that you aren't some fancy talker because fancy talk gets you nowhere. What's the power that you and I have? Spirit of God, the Word of God, the Gospel. It's the power of God and the salvation. So that's what we need to embrace. Don't get squirrely on me and think, man, preacher, I'm uncomfortable, I don't like this, I don't want to do it. Well, that's what Satan wants us to feel. That's how Satan wants us to act. But God says charge, okay? And so let's go forward for the cause of Christ, friendship, faith, fellowship. It's going to take some effort, but if we'll just do what God tells us to do, it'll be a blessing to us. All right, let's pass out our prayer uh, bulletins tonight. Let's go over our prayer requests. While they're, <clears throat> while they're passing those out, I do want to remind you about our missionary prayer sheets. Finish your current missionary prayer sheet, where you're at, what number you're on, the missionaries you're praying for, and then this Sunday start on the brand new prayer sheet with the next number. If you are on 17 on the old one, you'll be on 18 on the new one. And I hope that that's not confusing for you, um, uh, and, and I hope I said that well so that uh, we, we don't miss any of our missionaries going forward. All right, as uh, we're passing out our uh, prayer sheets, let's continue to pray for 
the Mueller's, uh, Mike is, is dealing with surgery recovery uh, and, and that's got some tenderness and, and some pain associated with that. Uh, it's coming along nice, but he was also diagnosed with cancer. And so uh, at the end of this month, he's uh, going to be uh, talking to the doctors and they're going to figure out uh, what they need to do as far as uh, treatment for that. And so uh, just pray for him. Just unbelievable uh, amount of anxiety that goes along with cancer. And so we need to be upholding uh, him and Miss Nancy in prayer. So please be faithful to do that. Uh, be an encouragement there um, and pray for wisdom for the doctors going forward and just pray that God would just bless in that and minister there. Todd also texted me today. He's having some really serious physical uh, issues connected with his lungs. Uh, they're concerned that it could be associated with some heart damage. Uh, he's, he's had uh, some poisons in his body that have just wreaked havoc on his heart and his health. Uh, from welding, uh, he got some poisoning there from chemicals, and uh, he's he's got really got the heart of an of an elderly person, and so uh, very serious physical problems. But that's starting to uh, just get a little worse, and so uh, he's had some uh, extreme pain in his in his body, uh, aches, and then the wheezing and not being able to breathe real well. And so pray for Brother Todd. Uh, of course, Brother Jim still recovering from his surgery pray for brother Jim and his uh, recovery miss Ernestine Shipman she's uh, uh, she's at home now but going back and forth from the doctors uh, she's having uh, just some issue with a severe bleeding and they don't know where she's losing blood from and so pray for her um, uh, as well um, uh, miss Judy uh, uh, asked to asked us to pray for her uh, tonight as well it's an unspoken uh, so Miss Judy brother Dean uh, I talked to him he's doing well um, as well as he can uh, he's not going to get better but he, he is doing okay uh, I'm going to uh, visit him uh, toward the end of the week here and so uh, just pray I have a good visit there with him they watch faithfully on Facebook, and, and uh, so praise the Lord for them, uh, and then continue uh, to pray for others that have been struggling, uh, surgery recoveries as well. Um, okay, Dennis is doing pretty good uh, with his hip replacement, um, but now his knee is giving him trouble, and there's a possible knee replacement coming up for Dennis as well, um, and so pray for him. Scott's doing great with his uh, hip replacement, and um, uh, and he had uh, herner, hernia surgery that he's doing well with there, so an update uh, on him. Any others that we need to add to the list? Yes? Amen. Wow, wow, amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, praise the Lord. Yes, any others? Uh, I'm sorry, people on Facebook, Miss Debbie was praising the Lord for her uncle uh, that was in the hospital for 90 days. He's now out of the hospital at home doing better. And so we were just praising the Lord about that. Any, uh, Pastor Tyler and Miss Amber are traveling uh, down to Florida tomorrow and uh, they're doing kind of a, a, what do you call that? A what? Survey trip, yep. Uh, they're doing a survey trip down there, just praying about the Lord's leading on, on where they're wanting to start a church. So pray for them and safety and travel and God's leading there. Um, uh, as well, uh, Larry and Diane are traveling to New Mexico uh, Friday, are you leaving Friday, and so pray that they have a great uh, time with family and the Lord makes that a profitable trip for them. Any others? Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight, and you're welcome to take this list home and pray through the week. You're welcome to stay and pray uh, here in the auditorium, pray with uh, your family, and let's bring these before the Lord in prayer, and uh, ask the Lord to be gracious and merciful in these prayer requests. Amen. God bless you.